afternoon. Um, thank you, Leora, for that introduction. And um, thank you especially to Ariella and Bazira and Leela and Aaliyah for inviting me to this conversation this afternoon and tomorrow um, and for making these two days what they are and turning this room into what it has become in the context of these conversations. Um, I also want to thank those of you who have already shared papers from which I've learned so much um, and which have pushed my own thinking. It's just a real joy to be able to be in conversation. This is the heart of what it is that we like to do, but we don't get to do it very often, I think. Um, and I also want to echo uh, Jasmine Johnson's call early in the day um, to thank the staff of the Cogut Center um, and especially Kit Salisbury for all of their organizational and logistical work in pulling this event together and also to the people who staff Brown University's custodial and facilities departments for making this room what it is in a very literal and material sense. I'm going to talk today to retouch, as it were, violence. Um, I have some questions and some stories, episodes sort of, that I think belong together but hang at present a bit like a kinetic sculpture. I think ties holding them are thin and unstable and shifting, and I keep realizing that as one thing shifts, the whole thing shifts. Um, so as I begin, I want to also preemptively thank all of you for indulging me in this little bit unstable um, collection of ideas. Um, so violence. Violence is a word that I use constantly in my work. Um, it strikes me as at least somewhat generational. Violence is the lexicon of black studies, feminist studies, slavery studies now. Um, and its presence offers a counter to previously embraced uh, jargon and frameworks like oppression um, in particular. Um, the ascendancy of violence in the historiography of Atlantic slavery, I think, turns scholarly attention toward the affective, the bodily, the interpersonal, the bare and barren acts within systems of power. Um, it attends to minutia, to the daily. Uh, violence draws our attention back to the body and away from accountancy, which is a critique that Jennifer Morgan has offered, I think, quite elegantly toward pain, which uh, Marisa Fuentes has offered, again, quite elegantly. Um, violence asks us to specify. And I think some of what I'm curious about here is which kinds of violence are specified under the name violence, and which kinds of violence re require modification, require additional specification. So some kinds of violence uh, need less specification, at least in my field, than in others. So race is ever-present in the framework of violence, um, while gender tends to invite modifiers, sexual violence, gender-based violence. I'll talk more about those um, languages in a minute. Violence in the context of um, black studies and slavery studies, and I think in feminist studies too, um, violence is saturated with race to the point where, at least in those fields, um, and I think far beyond, racial capitalism and imperialism are the implied province of violence. I speak rarely of structural sexual terror, although of course it is structural. Um, I take adjectival pains to articulate violence against women. I don't assume that they are implied by the concept. At the same time, there's near consensus in those fields, and particularly in, in studies of Atlantic slavery, following Jennifer Morgan, that women's labor, this is a quote, and their reproductive lives were at the heart of the entire venture of racial slavery. By the same token, Sidia Hartman writes more recently, quote, the theft, regulation, and destruction of black women's sexual and reproductive capacities would also define the afterlife of slavery. Nonetheless, it is my habit to modify violence when it seems specific to the gender of my subjects. When violence inheres in sex acts or results in birth, describes a woman beaten days after childbirth or involves the beating and murder of a pregnant person, my language changes immediately, fluidly, to sexual violence to amplify that this is a special formation of violence, not simple. This practice of modification suggests the question. If violence is, as a concept, always already saturated with race, is it not at once also saturated with sex? Scholars of Atlantic slavery answer clearly, well, of course it is. 
But whether such sex is involved with sexuality is complicated. Given the extent to which the law excluded enslaved women from the category of people who could be raped, which is also to say, and this is a clip from um, the Louisiana Black Code uh, from 1806, which is also to say um, the extent to which antebellum law quite uniformly across the US South for the majority of the antebellum period, there's a quick little thing that happens very much at the end of the antebellum period, 1859 Mississippi, but otherwise, this is very consistent. Um, antebellum law classifies rape a possibility only on the body of, as this Louisiana Codes announces, a white woman or girl. So this little clip of law has been an obsession of mine for nearly a decade. Um, following Sadia Hartman, I've been operating on the premise that the violence that women endured at the level of their sexuality could not, at least in the eyes of the law, could not be meaningfully disaggregated from violence broadly. Hartman asks, what does sexuality designate when rape is a normative mode of its deployment? What set of effects does it produce? How can rape be differentiated from sexuality when consent is intelligible only as submission? How can we discern the crime when it is a legitimate use of property or when the black captive is made the originary locus of liability? And this frame liability is really important to Hartman and to my comments today. Does the regularity of violation transform it into an arrangement or a liaison from which the captive female can extract herself if she chooses, as a lover's request or adultery would seem to imply? Can she use or wield sexuality as a weapon of the weak? Do four years and two children later imply submission, resignation, complicity, desire, or the extremity of constraint? In other words, is there sexual violence when the very tenets of sexual subjectivity are rendered irrelevant in the law? Horton Spillers and Aliyah Abdur Rahman echo Harriet Jacobs' haunting incantation that there was no shadow of law to protect her, arguing that the violence that black women incurred at the hands of slaveholders <coughs> expressed their profound exclusion from gender, not their subjugation on gender's normative terms. Yet it's unshakable to me that the women who lived as concubines to slaveholders, the women who I study, the women who staffed the brothels of an antebellum port city, performed a labor that was in fact distinctly sexual. And I think Elizabeth Bernstein and Adrian Davis would also suggest that much of that labor was adjacent to sex itself and involved intimate relations and affective labor. Absent, perhaps preceding, an epistemological universe in which sex acts and sex life could be understood as meaningfully discrete and meaningfully descriptive of the subject's interior life, it's nonetheless essential that some enslaved women were conscripted into labor that looked like the commodification of sex itself. This labor was, importantly, detached from reproduction. It's too easy in slavery studies to suggest that the pain that women lived through and died because of was logical. The sale of sex as sex points to the many sites of slavery's violences that far exceed any explanation of capital ex accumulation and suggest instead profound affective excess. So I want to retouch violence because my habit of, viol of, of modifying violence with sexual recalls its many modifications shepherd into the, shepherded into the public domain by feminists in the 1970s and 1980s. Gender-based violence, domestic violence, intimate violence, intimate partner violence, date rape, violence against women, sexual violence. These categories of analysis that developed out of and depend on the use of tort law to describe injury and anti-discrimination law are very much a 20th century phenomenon that does not map onto either 19th century jurisprudence or onto the existence of sex without sexuality, which is kind of how I've thought about the kind of sexual and intimate encounters of the erotic lives of the women that I study. Nonetheless, those formations of harm that the harm itself aren't at all unique to the 20th century. Indeed, those forms of harm were meticulously crafted and refined in the 19th century. So here's my question. How does the plainness of violence 
violence itself, violence as a concept, hide its deeply gendered logics. Is violence not fundamentally gendered? When might violence against women not need all those modifiers? If the impulse of this gathering is, as is so beautifully staged by our conveners, quote, based on the recognition that we produce knowledge on stolen lands with tools forged by slavery, genocides, and dispossession of different sorts, we, and this we here indicates Wazira and Ariella, Leela, and Aaliyah, um, we would like to invite the participants to propose and engage with concepts through which a different world can be imagined once acknowledgement of these crimes and the indispensability of reparations and retouch are assumed. So with the following episodes, I hope to retouch violence, to acknowledge its embedded crimes and the ongoing modalities of those crimes. I think here of, of uh, Shatima Threadcraft's work on the kind of erasure of femicide in the logic of the movement for black lives, really focusing on state violence and obscuring the kind of violence that happens in pr private spaces to women. And there are many endless iterations of the ways that violence against women gets um, pushed off stage. So the many modifiers that standardize violence as not about women and sex rely on a fiction of female culpability for harm that is done to them. So for the remainder of my comments, I want to talk about how women get framed as culpable for harm done to them. Anita Hill. Anita Hill became a household name because she testified in the process of Clarence Thomas's Supreme Court confirmation hearings in 1991 that Thomas had sexually harassed her when she was clerking for him, or working for him, sorry. Um, in any case, last year, um, as Brett Kavanaugh was being confirmed and also faced charges of sexual misconduct, in his case, sexual assault, um, those charges brought forward by Christine Blasey Ford, suddenly Hill was back in the public eye. And the suddenness of that was really apparent to me because a couple of years ago when I taught my students about Anita Hill, they didn't know who she was, and now they do. <laughs> Young feminists, journalists, and illustrators seem to find a comparative lens on their two testimonies irresistible. Immediately, Blasey Ford was an icon who made Hill an icon anew. With hands raised in good faith, they together became a visual spectacle of respectable, trustworthy, professional womanhood, signaling the universality of women's unfair experience before the law. This media frenzy produced them as mirror images in black and white. Feminists in the throes of Me Too took this opportunity to resurrect the framework of belief with respect to these women's words. I believe her. Believe women, believe us, believe survivors are all phrases that cite the older adage, I believe Anita Hill, worn on buttons and written in feminist, um, feminist essays at the time when Hill was testifying. Defiant articulations of belief. These articulations of belief are articulated as defiant, right? As a push back, as a refusal of a system that obviously doesn't believe women, because of course both of these men sit on the Supreme Court now. Um, defiant articulations of belief are nonetheless a capitulation to the logical norms of rape law and its derivatives, a capitulation which hold up the logic of transaction at the heart of a sexual encounter. Belief is only relevant in the context of an allegation of harm because the bedrock of rape law, consent, makes evidence into a magical object. If consent is at the heart of rape law, then the law imagines sexual contact, contact as a transaction. This means that rape cases are litigated much more like breach of contract than they are litigated like violent crime. American jurists have a long history of foundational curiosity when it comes to rape. Did she want it? Which really means, didn't she want it? And feminists who have recently upheld consent as a standard for getting us out of this jam have unwittingly ushered us into a new era of measuring desire as a mode of assessing harm. How much did she want it? When did she want it? When did she stop wanting it? And that's the really important one for feminists who back affirmative consent and enthusiastic consent as metrics of anti-violence work. By contrast, 
No one ever seems to think, not in the law itself or in the practice of the law, that someone wanted to die. In fact, even when someone actively wants to die, the presumption in US law has been that such desire is a mark of insanity, if not also criminality. It could not possibly be offered as a narrative evidence on behalf of a murderer. This is why there are no good rape victims. In the case of 19th century jurisprudence, the only good rape victim is a dead one. The transactional conceit of rape law is an artifact of patriarchy because women are burdened with maintaining their honor in the form of withheld speech acts, that is, withholding consent. I would also like to flag that I've learned about other meanings of honor, what it means to write the history of black women from my dear colleague, Aaliyah. When speech acts are central to investigations of violence, women's credibility rests on proof that she sacrificed her physical body, her life, her capacity to keep living, in order to preserve her sexual honor. This is indexed in the requirement in 19th century jurisprudence, but I would say also today, of quote, evidence of a struggle on the body as critical corroboration for a claim of sexual violence. So to believe women concedes too much. Belief lives in the province of instinct, of emotion, and of theology. Belief lifts up narrative experience which unwittingly foregrounds the question of whether the contract was breached and whether the complainant can rearticulate the terms of a contract and prove the breach. When belief is the standard, then clarity arrives only in the form of serialized violence, only when a chorus of women speak. We might think of the Larry Nassar case in the last couple of years or of what's happened with Harvey Weinstein in public, right? For some reason, it became only possible to believe when there's a chorus. And that's true in all levels, I think, at many, uh, at, in all levels of many institutions. The pattern, right, becomes essential to proving and getting in front of and preventing sexual violence. The logic of rape law, with its emphasis on consent and therefore on transaction, makes it nearly impossible to prove rape cases. Structuring the victim as a party to a contract incites curiosity about and confession from that victim about the part she played in the contract, diverting attention from the harm itself. What I want to suggest is that the framing of sex as a transaction is an artifact of patriarchy in the law and it's a location where the gender of violence lives. So I'm gonna tell a story now. Recy Taylor, this is Recy Taylor, um, was 24 years old. This is her at 24, she passed away at, I think, 93, um, just two years ago. Recy Taylor was 24 years old, a married black mother, when seven white teenagers followed her home from church in a green Chevrolet in 1944. The boys, as they're still called by white inhabitants of rural Abbeville, Alabama, forced her into their car, blindfolded her, and drove her into the woods where they took turns raping her. Their collective recounting of the event, collected only because Taylor immediately testified that she had been raped and was then supported by Rosa Parks and the NAACP um, and various outlets of the black press all recall a similar story. The, assail the assailants recounted the violence not in the voice of contrition or of confession, but rather in a language of accusation. None of Taylor's rapists could agree on when payment took place, but they each nonetheless mentioned that she was willing to go with them and that they had, quote, after they had, quote, had intercourse with her, they variously put cash into her hand. Their actions, they argued, were not, could not have been rape because she accepted payment for them. The yarn these teenagers spun to normalize their violent actions were part and parcel of the fictional world in which white people dwelled long after the end of the Civil War. It was a participatory fiction one which softened what was essentially white vigilante terrorism, night riders by Chevrolet, rather than on horseback. Instead of narrativizing the scene for what it was, an entire community of white Alabamans joined together to silence the possibility of rape. If, 
the events of that evening had happened at all, they all seemed to agree. They were only the actions of a few boys whose youthful play had gone a tad bit too far. But in any case, why did it matter? Their story of Taylor's prostitution was outrageous to anyone who knew the woman or her family, but it nonetheless signaled a much longer history in which black women's sexual bodies became available to white men through the specter of labor. With the birth of white vigilante terrorism during Reconstruction, Hannah Rosen has shown, white men narrativized and performed sexual violence against black women through invocations of black sexual labor. Recall Rosen, who explains that white men's terroristic invasion of freed people's homes during Reconstruction, and especially the performative displays of sexual humiliation and violation that of black women within those homes, quote, invented and communicated a fantasy post-Civil War, War world that could reassert, quote, the political privileges of whiteness bestowed by the system of slavery even on non-slave slaveholding white men, unquote. The central rhetorical strategy of this performance was cash. In the context of Knight Rider violence, the offer of, quote, five dollars for her person, surrogated the vocabulary of bodily ownership in slavery and reasserted the primacy of use value as the metric for engagement with black women's sexual lives, sexual bodies. The white supremacist tradition that enforced the relation between labor and violence, the one that had long assumed that money could buy a woman's consent, reinvented itself after slavery's demise. On a changing legal landscape, the modus operandi of white sexual violence against black women recalled its own past. Violence would be rewritten in the language of black women's willingness through and in transaction. Recy Taylor's rapists knew this script so well as to rearticulate it fluidly in their testimony and perhaps also in the moment of violating and mutilating her body in the woods. We can imagine, though there's no, no evidence to this effect, but I believe that uh, they may have actually placed money in her hand in the context of this scene. When the New York Times recounted in uh, Taylor's death in her 2017 obituary, the assailants, they, they recounted the assailants having repro reproduced this long-held logical fallacy. The New York Times wrote, quote, they had insisted that they had paid her and that it was not rape, unquote. That is also to say, they had insisted her, they had insisted that they had paid her and therefore it could not have been rape. Taylor's rapists staged their violence through the rubric of consent. In other words, they suggested she wanted it. Taylor's, Reese Taylor's sister, years later, remained unequivocal. Reese wasn't no prostitute. She was a Christian. If Taylor had survived the violence, she must also survive the libel that her assailants cast at her and at her family. That is, that she was a sex worker. She had to address this claim specifically because it provided the core justification for her violation. Indeed, the specter of her prostitution meant that her assailants did not even need to deny their culpability in sex with her or to find an alibi that could raise suspicion about their identities or their presence on the road that night. This is the gender of violence. Transaction is the critical hinge on which violence becomes illegible, impossible. The implication of the assailant's successful defense, no one was ever indicted for this crime, the implication is this. When there is transaction, there can be no violence. Women's culpability ascends in importance as the effects of violence disintegrate. So where did these 20th century night riders get their ideas from? These men understood that Taylor's humiliation was enmeshed in the humiliation of her family and of her race, and, it came, and those ideas came directly out of the scripts of the immediate post-slavery period in Reconstruction. And this is a, a very famous image from um, the Memphis riots, they're called the Memphis riots, a series of um, white vigilante terror attacks in Memphis in 1866, chronicled by um, Hannah Rosen and by Crystal Feimster. So um, these men understood that Taylor's life was bounded by 
the lives of her family members. Estelle Friedman has explained that women whose men had a tenuous relationship to citizenship could not receive even the meagerest protections that patriarchy afforded married white women of wealth. But here, these men also extended slavery's logics. Again, Rosen suggests um, that in the, in the postbellum period, white vigilantes entered black homes and enacted sexual violence with a level of theatrics that, again, quote, invented and communicated a fantasy post-slavery world that could reassert the political privileges of whiteness bestowed by the system of slavery even on non-slaveholding white men, which is to say that in this post-slavery moment, the fantasy that becomes possible is that all men, all white men, those who were previously slaveholding, but also those who were not previously slaveholding, but were nonetheless then and in, the, in that present in 1866, were themselves white, that they could now embrace without the actual kind of legal status of slaveholding, they could embrace the privileges of, non -slave, of, of slaveholding white men. So the key tools that Knight Riders used were to enact sexual violence within black women's homes, to, to, to destroy simultaneously the protection of marriage or patriarchy by forcing black men to fail at protecting black women, but also by insisting on the continued sexual availability of black women by enacting sexual violence against them in public, in front of their families, and often requiring, and this is the part where Rosen's analysis is so important, through the, through the um, testimony of women who came before the Freedmen's Bureau and said, this happened to me. We know that in the context of these scenes, there was also often a requirement that these women perform consent, which is to say, perform a kind of willingness in the face of this kind of terroristic violence in the scene. When Taylor's rapists emphasized cash, they insisted on the transactional nature of the scene. Their fiction of Taylor's prostitution cites a critical metaphor that emerged in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War as the KKK entered black homes and undercut newly won rights to freedom as consent, the consent to marry, the consent to self-sovereignty in the body. In other words, the possibility of a private life, a private home, a private body, which the law had promised to protect from intrusion sort of. They reminded black folks of their adjacency to slavery. The citational quality of this violence takes slavery as its origin story, but that's complicated because enslaved women were routinely used for sex by white men of slaveholding and non-slaveholding status, but also existed in this specific formation of mistress or concubine. That is to say, there were women who were not explicitly located within transactional sex in the context of enslavement, and then there were enslaved women who were. This is obviously a really complicated image, <clears throat> which I'm happy to talk about in q and um, I'm not convinced that postbellum night riders were citing histories of concubinage. Rather, they elided the notion of, I think it's implicitly white, prostitution with the history of slavery in order to resituate newly freed black women within the scene of sexual and labor degradation. But there's a whole world of enslaved women who worked in brothels and worked as concubines in the antebellum South. So when black women who are, were not, are not, in fact, working as prostitutes are called out of their name, are called prostitutes, the obvious response is, as is the case in Taylor's, um, Taylor's defense, she wasn't a prostitute, right? That's, that's what her sister says, and that's what the, the campaign for equal justice for Mrs. Reese Taylor really wants to emphasize. She's a mother, she's a wife, she's honorable. Um, so this is a problem, of course, right? Because what if she had been a prostitute? What does the claim of prostitution so neatly seem, why, why sorry, why does the claim of prostitution so neatly seem to make violence impossible? The racial nature of violence in US contexts as it emerged from the nomenclature of slaveholders and pro-slavery demagogues takes a, a particular form. It is necessary, it is good, it is a positive good. Violence here takes center stage, an affirmation of violence itself. This is the race of violence. The gender of violence is different. The gender of violence takes the form of transaction. She wanted it, she asked for it, she is culpable. How she begot the violence trumps the harm. The violence itself becomes irrelevant, or at least less relevant. Harm is sidestepped. Violence is sidestepped. Women's culpability is much, much, much more important. And so there's a way that in the context of the race of violence, which is the kind of um, language that that underwrites and encourages slavery in the antebellum South. It's a language that is like, 
fairly upfront about violence as a positive good, particularly after the 1830s. But I think the gender of violence works differently, and I think it's largely articulated through the framework of white prostitution and then grafts onto black women's bodies who are, of course, also simultaneously encountering the race of violence. So this is where it gets a little messy in my head, but um, I'm just gonna say a few more things to conclude. So the po this is the point I'm trying to make. <laughs> If the question that haunts the examples I began with is essentially, what if she had been a prostitute? Then the history of slavery calls us to answer it because of course she was a prostitute. That is, enslaved women did work in situations of transactional sex. So that's really complicated. And the extent to which they can be understood as parties to the contract is utterly encased by their enslavement. Um, but for the purposes of this kind of thinking through of violence, I want to move with this for a minute. So this image um, shows a woman named Eliza who's being separated from her daughter, Emily, um, at a slave market. It's an image that shows up in Solomon Northup's um, uh, 12 Years a Slave, and it re it's rearticulated, right? So, so here, um, the kind of question that I'm trying to raise about concubinage and really about transactional sex, the extent to which enslaved women are involved in transactional sex in the antebellum South is articulated through Northup's language as on condition, right? So her, her living, her capacity to live, which is to say her capacity to see her child live, um, is related to a condition of her living with this man. And Wells Brown, uh, William Wells Brown articulates this in his narrative as a contract. Um, Harriet Jacobs articulates a bargain. Um, so this kind of language of transaction is all over the antebellum narratives. Um, so these women's lives, I think, lived very much at the heart of transaction, were also obviously lived in the midst of, at the heart of violence. Prostitution as metaphor points to the gender of violence. Prostitution animates a simple question of contract, which then nullifies the possibility of violence. Prostitute must remain outside the possibility of violence. And here I'm thinking with the, 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 the comments, Palomi, that you made earlier are so resonant with um, some of the thinking that I'm trying to do here. It was really helpful to hear you think through some of that stuff earlier um, uh, about sort of the um, recuperation of some women and the exclusion of others. Um, so prostitute remains outside the possibility of violence because party to the contract, her hands are unclean. She is an, an impure victim, which means, of course, that she can be no victim at all. Transaction is at odds with the possibility of injury. The reality of the social, erotic, and intellectual lives of the women enslaved as concubines and in brothels in the U.S. South cracks the code on this, I think. The very plain torture that enslaved women endured while and because of their location within transactional sex, not outside of, not mitigated by, but because of their relationship, their, their location within transactional sex, calls the bluff on the white vigilantes, on the night riders, and also those whose Invocation of belief belies the long history of the perceived incredulity of women, which is also to say the long life of their perceived participation in and culpability for their own violation. Thanks. <laughs>